Today, Science Max is all about sound. We bend the power of sound to our will by making the loudest sound we can. A sub, wait a minute, a subwoofer. <laughs> subwoofer. Make cornstarch mud dance, glasses break, and things vibrate. <laughs> it's the sounds of science. Today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science... Yeah, that's much better. Greetings, Science Maximites, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Today, we're going to be talking about sound. Sound is all around us. We use it every day, but what is it, really? Sound is energy. Let's say that this is the... That this... No, stay. Stay. Okay that this spring is the sound of my voice. When I make noise, it travels away from me in a wave. One air molecule vibrates the next, the air molecule vibrates the next, and it looks like a wave. And when there's a little bit of energy, the wave doesn't move very much. Science! But when there's a lot of energy, the wave moves a lot. Science! What do we do? What do, what do we do? to make sound louder. This is the Science Max theme song. But it's not very loud, because the speaker on my phone isn't designed to make super loud noises. So what we're going to do is find ways to make the volume of that song as loud as possible. Here is one way. Take a phone playing some music and put it in a glass. Make sure the glass is empty, of course. Huh? And suddenly, it's a lot louder. Wow! Why this works is one of the things we're gonna be looking at today. So that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna learn how to make sound louder, as loud as we can. But I'm gonna need an expert to help me. Um, oh, I know, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. She's very smart. All I need to do is go to the Ontario Science Center and see if she's busy. Kayla, it's good to see you. Thanks to see um, you too. That was weird. I was wondering if you could give me a hand with an experiment. Oh, I'd love to, yeah. It's a sound experiment. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Right on. <laughs> okay, we'll take the portal. We'll go back to Science Max headquarters. Oh, we take the portal? Cool. Haven't you taken the portal before? No, don't you remember? It wasn't working last time. Oh, well, it's... Is it working? ...fixed this time. Yeah, no, it'll be <laughs> great. Trust me. Here we go. Usually when I come through the portal, I land on something or something falls on me or... Not today. It's your lucky day. I guess so. Safe landing. Safe nice. landing. High five. All right. So let's get started. Okay, cool. This is the experiment I want to max out today, Michaela. I know. Pretty impressive, right? No, no, hold on. <laughs> okay. So I take my phone and I play some music on my phone and... It's loud, Yay, right? Check it out. Now, you've just made yourself a resonance chamber. A resonance chamber. A Very resonance nice. chamber is what we say when we're trying to describe how the sound is amplified. So if the sound's coming in from one direction, it's bouncing around, not really losing energy. Mm -hmm. So when more sound comes in, that's amplified. We hear it a lot louder. That's cool. So that's what I want to do. Hold on, let me turn this off. That's what I want to do today. I want to max out as much sound as we can get out of the Science Max theme song, oh, which I'm is so totally awesome. So, what else can we do to do that? Uh, well, there's a couple avenues I'm thinking. Do you want to try something with electricity or without electricity? That's because with electricity, we're talking speaker systems and. and yeah. Right. So, we why don't we do no electricity for now and then right. we can jump to electricity when we feel we've we've exhausted everything that's non-electric. Cool, so I was thinking we could try to make a megaphone because uh, if we have a lot of sound, we could you know, funnel it in one direction and then it'll be louder. Okay, what yeah, so the megaphone's pretty easy to make, right? We could just use, in fact, we could use this piece of paper, right? Yeah, let's try it. What do you think? Uh, I think it's very mega megaphony. Science taping it up. Okay, ready? <laughs> okay, turn it on. 
play it. And doesn't sound, but what if I do this? Hey, there it is. And I'm oh, that song. Yeah. <laughs> you hear it? Yeah. Oh, I hear it. Okay. <laughs> so that worked pretty well. So. Oh, yeah, it works. It works well. So, okay, so this is pretty easy, right? Yeah. Megaphone? Oh, yeah. So why don't we max this out? Why don't we make a giant megaphone and see if it makes a big difference? I think it will. Let's do it. Sounds good. Let's get started. <laughs> vibration, but it's really hard to... It's really hard to learn about that vibration if you can't see it. I mean, sound is invisible, right? Well, here's a way that you can make sound visible. All you need is some plastic wrap and salt and a bowl, just a regular bowl, and an elastic, like this. So what you do is you take the plastic wrap and cut off a piece just large enough to fit over the bowl, and then use the elastic to wrap around the bowl to keep the plastic tight. Pour some salt on the bowl, and then watch this. Hello, vibrating salt. The plastic wrap is stretched tight over the bowl, making it like a drum, a drum that's very sensitive to sound vibrations. Your ear works the same way. That's why we call it an ear drum. The vibrations from my voice make the plastic wrap vibrate, and that makes the salt dance. But there's more. Let's max this out. This is a cladney plate, and what it is is just a piece of metal on a platform that vibrates up and down to a frequency which I can program with this dial here. And when the sound waves vibrate the plate, they can interact in ways that make the sand form interesting patterns. Take a look. The sounds I'm generating vibrate the plate, make it move like a wave. But when the vibrations reach the edge of the plate, they bounce back and interact with the other waves going the other way. The way these waves interact at different notes is what causes the sand to make these different shapes. So this is great, but you know what? We can max it out even more. Maxing it out even more. That's about as much as I can take of that. Whoa. So Michaela and I are on a quest to make the loudest sound we can. The first step is to make things louder without using electricity. We've looked at a resonance chamber, and now we're going to make a large megaphone. Sounds can be amplified by bouncing sound waves around in a space. When I put my phone into the glass, the glass acts as a resonance chamber. The sound waves bounce around inside the glass and they combine and stack on top of each other. This makes the sound louder. Residence chambers are used by musical instruments like an acoustic guitar. The wooden chamber bounces the sound waves around and the sound waves build on each other to make the sound louder. A megaphone bounces sound waves as well. Instead of going off in all directions, a megaphone makes the sound waves all go in one direction. That's one of the reasons why a megaphone makes sounds louder, but only when it's pointed at you. So will a bigger megaphone work better? So we've made a larger megaphone, which is exactly the same thing. You just take a sheet and you roll it up, except our sheet was plexiglass covered in paper, and we've taped it together so it stays. And the idea here... Oh, yeah, bigger megaphone. We're going to vibrate even more of the air inside of here, and hopefully this thing will be louder. Okay, so you're ready to try it with the phone? Yeah. I think first we should try it with our voices, though. Okay. Now, what's your favorite season? Awesome. I can totally hear you. That's favorite. amazing. And it would be fall. No. Nah, summer. Mm, spring? Think it's about it. anything but winter. So the maxed out megaphone worked, but we still had to try it with my phone. Okay. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. How about now? No, not so much. Not so much. Oh, yeah. <gasps> no, no. Oh. So that is a that great cool. example of non-electrical amplification. That's right. Amplify the sounds, no electricity. OK, bye-bye. <laughs> Make some noise! Well, how do you make noise? 
Well, to know that, you gotta know your sound. Hey. All sound is vibration. Here, take a closer look. You see? You got. Whoa. Okay, let's try this again. All sound is vibration. The string of this guitar vibrates, which vibrates the air around it, causing the sound that you hear. Your vocal cords vibrate in your throat, causing you to make a sound. Look at this thing. Look at this thing. See how it's shaking back and forth? And it's vibrating. Things that make a high sound, they vibrate faster. Vibrating really fast. <laughs> Things that make a low sound vibrate slowly. <laughs> High note, vibrating fast. Fast! <laughs> has a resonance, a note that it vibrates best at. Let's say this fish tank is, well, any container where sound would be vibrating, and the waves of water are actually waves of sound. Now, normally, sound waves will bounce around inside the container, off the walls, and go back and forth like that. And how fast I move this piece of wood is the frequency, or the note, that we're playing. I could vibrate this wood very fast and make a high note, I could move this plank very slow and make a low note. And the waves just bounce around inside the container. But there's a speed I can move this plank where the waves stop going side to side and suddenly get twice as big. The waves bouncing off the sides of the tank are meeting the waves going in the other direction. But what we end up seeing is peaks of the waves not moving side to side, just going up and down, like you see here. This is the resonant frequency of this container. So, let's max this out. Say I have a wine glass, and I wet my finger, and I rub it around the rim. It vibrates at a certain note. That note is the resonant frequency of this wine glass. So what would happen if we were to play that note back to this wine glass really, really loud? And yes, this is something you should not try at home. This note makes the glass vibrate the most. Finding the perfect note things vibrate best at is great for musical instruments, but it's not great for this wine glass. The sound waves are causing the glass to vibrate a lot. And because this glass is delicate, it can only vibrate so much before it breaks. The vibrations were so strong that the glass literally shook itself to pieces. <laughs> Science! Sorry. Science! Oh, wait. Science! <laughs> Michaela and I have tried a resonance chamber and a giant megaphone to make sound louder. Now it's time to move on to the next step of the plan using electricity to help us amplify sound. And that means speakers. So speakers that you have at home, three different speakers here, right? Looks three really different busy. cones. Yeah, there's a lot going on. So here. what's the deal? Well, here at the bottom, uh, we have a subwoofer. A sub, wait a minute, a subwoofer. <laughs> subwoofer. So it's a, a woofer, the word is woofer. <laughs> yep. And it's, okay, so it's for dogs. <laughs> Right? No, no, a subwoofer is for low notes here in our speaker. Ah. At the top here, we have a tweeter. So it's for birds. It's it birds, dogs. <laughs> so low, let me guess, low notes? Yeah. It's tweeters, high notes? Yeah, yeah, high notes. And then we have this guy here in the middle, and that's called your mid-range speaker. Oh, that's not nearly a cool name. <laughs> now we have speakers, we've taken a look at that, but why don't we take one apart, cool. right? Yeah, let's do it. I've got this one here that I spilled juice on. <laughs> um, so it doesn't work anymore. So I've kind of taken it apart. So cool. it's oh, got man, that's awesome. 
Okay, so it's got the cover. Yeah. That's cool. So what I find interesting is there's there's the speaker and the wires, right? Because yeah. it's electrical amplification. But check this out. This is just a ring to hold that on. And the rest is just an empty box. We know what that is. Resonance, Resonance chamber. chamber. <laughs> that's right. So that's why it's an empty box. So Let's take this apart too, see what's going on. So that's just, that's the paper cone, yeah. right? So that's the, like, that's the drum, I guess. It's like the eardrum, the thing that vibrates. Yes, yeah. yeah, this cool thing vibrates. So that yeah. this whole that's thing. That's our electromagnet. When we turn this on, the electromagnet goes on and off, and uh, it's causing this whole thing to vibrate. So that's how it works. It's the electricity top turning the electromagnet on and off. Exactly. And it's on and off, and on and off, and on and off, and on and off. <laughs> and then <laughs> it, makes it makes it vibrate at certain speeds, right? Yeah. Hertz. The number of times it vibrates per second is hertz. What we could do is we could max it out with the speaker and plug the phone into the speaker. Mm -hmm. But this step does not feel like science max to me because anybody can do that, right? Yeah. You can just turn up your television right now and that's pretty much the same kind of thing. We yeah. need electrical amplification, but maxed out. Max it out. What are you thinking? Okay, so I, I, I've got a friend. Yeah. And he's got a stereo system that he built, put together. And what he does is he tours different cities. So he said he'd bring it by what? Science Max headquarters. He's gonna bring it here? We gotta go outside. We can see this thing. And it's very loud, so we have to go outside. Wait, when's he coming? Um, right now. <laughs> All right, let's go check it out. Seeing sound vibrations is fun. This kind of speaker is a special kind. It's called a subwoofer, which is designed to give you the low notes, the big rumbly bass sounds. I tilt the speaker so it's facing up and cover it with big sheets of plastic wrap, which I push into the cone. Then tape it so it's nice and secure. Then what you need is some cornstarch mud, which is two parts cornstarch, one part water. I've got some yellow cornstarch and some blue cornstarch. This experiment works the best with low notes. I'm playing a tone through the stereo that is very low. Here's what happens when I turn up the volume. It, it turns solid. So the vibrations from the speaker cone are making the cornstarch mud impact, and that's turning it into a solid. But then it sort of also melts back into a liquid, so you get little columns of cornstarch coming up and falling down again. It's like it's dancing. Whoa! Visual sound waves. So Michaela and I are going to max out sound. To do that, we need a maxed out sound system. This is gonna be amazing. This so is gonna cool. be super maxed out sound experiment. This I'm is so James, fun. Michaela. Hey James, James. Nice how are you? you? Thanks for coming, buddy. Nice to meet you. So, tell us about your speaker system. It looks a lot like a vehicle. <laughs> This is my audio van. It's got four 15-inch subwoofers in the back. It's got a whole bunch of power to power it, and I'm glad to be here to let you guys hear it today. Wow. Awesome. So if I have a speaker at home, the, like a little speaker like this, how many watts do you think that would be? Somewhere between 15 and 25. 15 and 25 watts, yes. And you've got 4,000. Yes. So that's a lot more. Yeah, quite a bit. And subwoofers, they play low notes. Yes. So is that better when you have a van like this? With a car audio van like this, you want to play low notes, like your house stereos, and that will play anything from 120 to 200 hertz. I'm playing 20 hertz to about 35 max for you guys today. So that's like a yeah. sort of rumble of thunder. Yes, very kind low. Of blah, 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 yeah. Where you really feel it. Yes. Like a train going past almost. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So we get our hearing protection on and we try it out. I know what you're thinking. Phil, what's the point of having loud music if you can't really hear it? Because we've gone from listening to music to feeling it. <laughs> the sound waves are so strong that they have become a physical presence. Michaela's hair flies around because the air from the speakers is creating shock waves. 
The sound waves are so powerful, they move the air back and forth, which makes Michaela's hair dance all over the place. And my hair, not so much. Jealous of your long hair? Yeah, you need to get longer hair. Okay, hold on, I'll get that right. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> Science back! Experiments at large! Super, Super sound! sound! High fives! Yeah, okay, ready to go again? So cool. Yeah, let's do it! Okay, here we go! Magnets are magnets you can turn on or off when you want. We build our own electromagnet and see just how powerful we can make it. It held 100 kilograms. Plus ferrofluid, wizards, and I try to get to the North Pole using a compass. Now that I'm here, I realize it's really difficult. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. At this very moment, half the lab is being held together with the power of electromagnets. And magnet one turning off. <laughs> electromagnets are a really cool and powerful way to interact with the world. And when I say power, that's because you need power to make them work or not work. <laughs> Magnetism is an invisible force that has to do with the magnetic fields created by magnets that lets them attract things that are metal or each other. But electromagnetism is a little different. You see, magnets are magnets all the time. It's because of what they're made out of. Electromagnets are only a magnet when you have an electric current going through them, which means you can turn them on or off. Today, we're gonna be building an electromagnet. Oh, that was, that was the wrong switch. Anyway, like I was saying, today we're gonna be building an electromagnet. You need a bunch of copper wire, a very large nail, or something metal to become your electromagnet, electrical tape, a battery, an on-off switch, wire strippers or a craft knife, and the help of an adult, and finally, something to magnetize, like these paper clips. And remember, all of the steps for this experiment are on the website. To begin, take the copper wire and start at the top of the nail. Leave a little bit of wire sticking out, then carefully start to wrap the wire around the nail. Don't go all the way to the end because you need some metal to turn into the magnet. Instead, when you want to start again, run the wire straight back to the top and start wrapping again in the same direction. And keep wrapping and wrapping until you get to this. Now I've used some electrical tape here, here, and here to hold it all together. Using your wire strippers or a craft knife and the help of an adult, remove the plastic coating from the ends of the wires. Attach these wires to the wires from the on-off switch with electrical tape, or attach them directly to a battery if you don't have an on-off switch. And ta-da, you have an electromagnet with your on-off switch. All you need to do is take the things you're going to magnetize, turn your electromagnet on, and suddenly it becomes a magnet. Pretty amazing. <laughs> and then you can magnetize to your heart's content. But when you're done, don't forget, you want to turn it off. So that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna max out the electromagnet. So, where's my lab coat? Oh, there it is. We're gonna see how big we can make an electromagnet. And when I say we, I mean me and an expert. Let's see. Oh, Heather from the Ontario Science Center. She knows her way around magnets. So let's see. Uh, yeah. I wonder if she's busy. Well, let's find it. After we're done, I'll need to come back and clean up the giant mess I made in the lab. Hey! Hi, Heather, how are you doing? Good, good to see you, Phil. I was just wondering if you could help me with something. Are you busy? 
No, I've got time. i got time. Okay, great, because I'm going to make a giant electromagnet experiment, and I need your help. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, great. Let's great. go back to Science Max headquarters. Oh, oh we'll by uh, the portal? Yeah, by the portal. Oh, oh. okay. You sure? I, uh, yeah. I know you're hesitant, so I want to reassure you, nothing will go wrong. Great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Oh, hey, we're here. We're yeah. outside. It's, it's okay. It's no, okay. Don't, no, don't worry about it. No, 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 I think it's definitely. You all right? Yeah. I was supposed to come in over there, but I came in over here. Uh, oh, well. <laughs> so today, Heather, I want to max out the electromagnet. Turn it on, and it's a magnet. Pretty good. And turn it off and it stops being a magnet. <laughs> I want to make this uh, into a much bigger, maxed out version. All right. So what, what are some of the things we can do to do that? Well, actually, if you have a larger battery, one that has a higher voltage, we can try that for sure. OK, that so will there, help. Are, there are batteries that are 12 volts. Yes. We could try one of those. Try, I think those sure. are like bigger, right? Yeah, yeah, bigger, more powerful, absolutely. Now, that's one thing you could do. You mm -hmm. can also increase the number of wraps of our coil here. So how many times we wrap that wire? Yes, we'll increase that magnetic field, making our magnet stronger. And of course, the nail, which is important because that's the thing that, that eventually becomes the magnet, right? Right on, yes. So what I thought we would do is we would start with a bigger nail. Oh. What, right? Yeah. So a uh, larger battery. Yes. More voltage and a lot more wraps of the wire. Right on. And we have more space for that now, which yes. is smart. Good job. Great. OK, so uh, we'll get to work. Great. Max Historica. If you've ever seen a compass, you know that the needle points north. That's because a compass needle is a magnet, and it points towards the Earth's magnetic North Pole, and I'm using this compass to try to get to the North Pole, but it isn't easy. In fact, scientists knew there was such a thing as the North Pole as far back as the 16th century, but no one was able to actually get there on foot until 1927. You'd think it wouldn't be that hard, right? I mean, the needle points you straight there. Just follow the needle, right? But now that I'm here, I realize it's really difficult. I mean, the wind is incredible, and the snow is intense, and and it's so cold, my hands are, my hands, um, yeah. So, OK, we're not really at the North Pole. We were just sort of recreating uh, that. Um, but still, I salute the brave explorers who tried to make it there in the name of science. And I got a sense of it because the, the, the wind from the fan and the, and the, fake, the fake snow was, um, OK, everybody, let's pack it up. I mean that was that was that was pretty good. I just didn't know about that other about that other camera. So, back to our main experiment, where Heather and I are building a larger electromagnet. An electromagnet works like this. When an electric current is traveling through a wire, it creates a magnetic field. If you wrap that wire around something ferromagnetic, that's something made out of a metal that is attracted to magnets, like an iron nail, then it becomes a magnet. You can make a magnet stronger by wrapping more wire, which gives more distance for the current to travel, increasing the magnetic field, and you can also increase the strength of the current. Heather and I start with a coil of 30 meters of wire and start wrapping and wrapping, and wrapping. There, the wire is now all done. And remember, if you're doing this at home, do not use a drill unless you have an adult to help you out, because drills can be very dangerous. This one goes at a very slow speed, so it was OK. But yes, definitely an adult supervised activity. Then we attach another on-off switch and make some leads that connect to a 12-volt battery. So more wraps of wire and more current means the electromagnet should be stronger. OK. So we're going to try this electromagnet, and we're going to pick up this stuff right here. Great. Ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Three, Three two, two, one, go! Is it on? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it really does. You can't tell that it's on, but. No, but bring it closer and. Oh, yeah, look at that. OK, let me turn it off. All right. <laughs> Let's see if this nail can pick up this nail. All right. Ready? 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 Go. Uh, uh. Oh. OK, how about this side? Oh. No. Uh, no. 
I don't think it's, we're strong enough. It's not strong enough. I, I think that we need to max this out uh, even more. Even more? Right. Um, so I'm thinking there are a lot of appliances that use electromagnets, meaning it's already set up, it already has tightly wound coils and high voltage, so we're in a lab here. Maybe do you have old yeah. uh, appliances around? I have, I have parts bins with a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe oh. we could find some electromagnets in those. Let's do it. Okay, great, yeah. let's go. Wires, battery, copper wire. Now, if you've already done the electromagnet experiment, here's another experiment that uses all the same materials, plus these. Ha! Neodymium magnets, some of the strongest magnets you can get. So, here's what you need. A battery, some neodymium magnets the same diameter as your battery, copper wire, and some pliers. So here's what you do. First thing is you put the batteries and the magnets together like that. Then what you want to do is bend the wire so it's touching the top of the battery and goes around the battery and then touches the magnets at the bottom. Here's what that might look like. I say might because you can do any shape you want. I've made a coil here. And if you put it over the battery, you'll see it only touches the very top of the battery and the magnets at the bottom. And if I let it go, it spins. It's a homopolar motor. What happens is the battery sends an electric current through the copper wire, and that turns it into an electromagnet, which is attracted to the magnets at the bottom, and it spins. So, now, let's max it out. Ha-ha! A D-cell battery, which is larger, and, of course, larger neodymium magnets. And you do the same thing. Make a coil that only touches the battery at the top and at the magnet, and... Ha-ha! It spins! Maxed out homopolar motor. But don't worry, this is not the biggest size we're gonna do. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Maxed out homopolar motor! I have 27 D cell batteries, a giant copper tube, and a neodymium magnet. So I'm just gonna, and then we get, get rid of that. Put this down. Okay, so the first thing I do is attach the neodymium magnet to uh, the batteries. And I've got all the batteries taped together here so they'll sort of stand up like, like this. Huh? <laughs> Giant stack of D cell batteries. Okay, now what I do is I take the copper coil. I take the copper coil. Um, I need to get, I need to get. Okay, hold on, hold on. I got this. I just need to get the copper coil there. <laughs> I did it. Okay, so I take the copper and I put it on top of the D-cell batteries like this, and then I let it go. <laughs> let it go. Nope, whoa. Homopolar motor. Okay, so that didn't work, but that's okay. I like it when it doesn't work, because that's science. It's not science if it works perfectly every time. I mean, you, you gotta have some room for improvement. Heather and I built a larger electromagnet, but it still wasn't as powerful as we hoped. So now we're searching for parts that came out of an appliance that are pre-built electromagnets. What about this? I think that'll do the trick. Do you think this is, an, this is, that does look like an electromagnet, huh? It does, yeah. And there's a whole big bunch of, of copper wires coiled, coiled on that. around. So you think we can use this? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, great. We built the next version of the electromagnet. This one already has the copper coils, so it's just a matter of attaching wires and an on-off switch, and attaching all of it to a 12-volt battery. Do you think 12 volts will be enough? Let's find out, I think so. Try that. Once we do, Ooh. it works much oh, better. Oh, no problem at all. Ready? Yep, turn it on. On. Whoa, oh. pretty good. <laughs> okay, off. off. Neat. In case it was really strong, I have the next step. Horseshoe! Okay, ready? Oh, whoa! That's... Here. I can't pull that off. I... Okay, wait, grab this. Okay? Work together. Yep. 
<laughs> so that's passed all of our tests. Yeah. This is really strong. Um, is what there a way we... to test it further? In order to test how strong our magnet is, it's as easy as seeing how much weight it'll lift. Heather and I find a metal table. All right, Phil, so I brought the electromagnet. Okay. Just put it right here. Yep. We add some sandbags for more weight and then attach a scale so we can measure how much weight we're lifting. We use a chain hoist, a simple machine made for lifting heavy things. This one can hold up to 454 kilograms. Want to turn it on? Ready? Yep. Here we go. You can read on the scale how much weight is being lifted. And that scale is going up. Pounds on this side, kilograms on this side. We keep lifting until... Okay, so how much did it hold? It held 100 kilograms. Oh, that's more than I weigh, which gives me an idea. Come on. This is ferrofluid. It is ferromagnetic, which means it's attracted to magnets. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it's not that interesting. Well, watch as I put it next to this magnet. Mm. Very interesting. And because it's a liquid, it behaves in very interesting ways. Watch this. Unlike most things ferromagnetic, like paper clips or iron filings, ferrofluid is a liquid, which means it behaves in a unique way. The spikes it creates are following the magnetic field lines of the magnet. You can see the magnetic field in 3D. It's even more impressive when we max it out. This is ferrofluid outside of a glass jar. Now, it's sitting in a pool around this electromagnet. And this is a dial which I can use to change the voltage of the electromagnet, making the magnet stronger. Watch this. Changing the current going to the spiral in the middle turns it into a magnet. The more current I put in, the stronger that magnet becomes allowing the ferrofluid to climb the spiral to the top. And remember, even though it looks all spiky, it's still a liquid. I will demonstrate with my plastic spoon. And watch this. When I turn the magnet off, it stops being spiky. Turn it on. Turn it off. Science. Uh. The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic. And you will be granted entry. Well, Fuzzix, who is the next applicant for the Wizard Academy? Overwhelmo. Indeed it is I, Overwhelmo. And prepare to be overwhelmed. Would you be flabbergastified if I balanced this coin on its end? Not really, no. But would you be impressed if I was to balance this coin on top of this coin? Possibly. Prepare to be flustered and stupefied. Stupi. Stupi flustered as I balance three coins on their ends on top of this glass. Well, that certainly would seem like magic. Let us see. Okay. No pressure, Overwhelmo. You can do this. And now, I say, a magic word. A magic word! Ha 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 ha! And now, you must let me into your academy. Wait. What's under the cloth? What, what cloth? This cloth, nothing! Is that a magnet? This? No! The pull of the magnet is what's keeping those coins up. The magnet is just strong enough to keep the coins from falling. No! This is set... set dressing. It's just... <laughs> it was a good trick, but it's science, not magic. Well, yes. And you will see! You will see! I will be back! I, Overwhelmo, will return! And I will do such magic that you will need extra socks because I will knock them off! With my magic, you will need at least two pairs of socks, maybe three pairs of socks. We can still see you! No, you can't!
So back to our main experiment. Heather and I have created a very strong electromagnet that can hold a lot of weight. It held 100 kilograms. Oh, which gave me an idea. All right, you ready? Let's do it. Electromagnets, super max out experiment. We've got two electromagnets, one, two. And those are wired to two batteries, which are on my belt, just like this, so that I can carry them around. And we've got a crash mat here because... We need to keep you safe because you're gonna be using these electromagnets to get across this massive beam above us. That's right, I'm gonna stick to this metal beam and go across with the electromagnets, wow. we, we hope. I, I have faith. I, I'm <laughs> glad you do. I've got a helmet for safety, goggles for safety, gloves for safety, but in this case, sometimes a lab coat is more safe and sometimes it's less safe. This time, it will get all caught up, so no, no lab coat. All right, you ready to go? I'm ready, let's do it. Okay. Oh my goodness. What? Okay. Because each of our electromagnets can hold more than my whole body weight, I can use them to cross the beam. When they're on, they stick like, well, magnets. And when I turn them off, they stop being magnets and I can move them along as I go. Now, this is something you should definitely not try at home. Come on, Phil. You're almost there. Ah! <laughs> we did it. Yeah. There you go, Science Max Experiments at Large Electromagnets. Woo! You wanna go? No. You sure? I'm positive. Okay, <laughs> I'm going again. Woohoo! Crazy. <sighs> This episode of Science Max is all about storing energy and releasing it. Yeah, let's try it out for real. Storing it in a giant spool racer, plus a domino chain reaction, mouse trap chain reaction, popsicle stick chain reaction, and more. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. <laughs> okay, three, two, one, go. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. Wow, I really need some more energy. Fortunately, I have some saved up. Ah, that's better. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Storing energy like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you can store energy, and that's what this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large is all about. In fact, I'm gonna store some energy in this container simply by putting it up here on the top shelf. More on that later. But right now, let's look at another way that you can store energy and release it in a really fun way. We're gonna make a spool racer, and it's pretty simple. Here's all you need. You need some science ribbon. Now, if you don't have science ribbon, you can use regular ribbon, but the ribbon really isn't important. It's the spool that's important. You'll also need a washer, elastics, pencil or pencil crayon, popsicle or craft stick, and science tape. Science tape is the same as invisible tape, except I use this one only for science. Here's how you build it. Break the popsicle stick so it's smaller than the diameter of the spool. Then put the elastics on top of the pencil and pull them tight, thread the popsicle stick through, and feed it all through the hole of the spool. Grab the elastics on the other side and pull out the pencil and everything will be threaded perfectly. Then stick on the washer and thread the pencil through. Finally, tape the popsicle stick down so it doesn't move. And if any of these steps are a little too fast, don't worry. All of the instructions are up on the website. That was cool. I, uh, I, can't, I can't make it go away. I can only make it come up. So there you go, a spool racer. And here's how it works. You spin the pencil around, and that twists the elastic. Now that elastic is gonna wanna unwind, right? So just keep spinning that pencil around until it's good and tight. And then when you put it on the ground, the pencil's gonna wanna unwind, but it can't because the table's in the way now, which means that the energy is gonna transfer to the spool, which is gonna turn, whoa, and it's gonna drive away. Yeah, let's try it out for real. So why does this work? It works because the elastic is coiled, right? Yes, and because I'm putting in the energy to twist it. You see, I'm putting in effort to spin this pencil crayon around, and then when I've finished, all of my effort has been stored in the elastic. When I let it go, my energy transfers into movement. So that's, uh-oh. 
That's what we're gonna do today, Science Maximites. We're gonna max out the spool racer. I think Anthony would really know how to help me with this. So, I'm off to the Ontario Science Center. Come on. What happened? Are you okay? Anthony. Yeah, hi. Oh, were you, in, were you in the middle of something? I don't worry about it, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. You know what, I was wondering if I could get your, your help with something. Sure, yeah. Yeah, one word, spool racer. Actually, actually, that's two words, spool, yeah. spool yeah. racer. Yeah. yeah. Cool. You wanna help me max out a giant spool racer? Uh, yeah. Awesome, let's go back to Science Matt headquarters. Okay, Anthony. Today, I want to max out the spool racer. Awesome. Right? So you twist up the elastic, and it goes from potential energy, all stored, to... Kinetic. Kinetic energy. Whoa. There we go. That's awesome. So... Okay. Not too hard to design. Should be fairly easy to yeah, max really out. Yeah, really simple couple of parts here. We just got elastic band inside. Yep. And then this big, long pencil to store the energy and then release it. And the most important part... Ah. Is spool. Is the spool. Exactly. And I know where we should start. Where's that? Right here. This is an industrial uh -huh. cable spool. So the big, thick electrical cables, they come wound on this thing. Yeah, OK. So that figure. We Whoa. start with this. Got right? it. And the good news is that it's got a hole already. And check it out. It rolls, it rolls really well, right? Uh-huh. OK, cool. Uh -huh. OK, OK. So uh, guess... bungee cord yep. and long pole or something. Yeah. And uh, we're ready to go. I guess let's get some parts. Okay. Okay. Oh, hey, how you doing? Y you want to buy something? I got a lot of stuff here, and I got a special today only. Potential energy, huh? I will throw in some potential energy with any order. You see this stuff on the shelves here? The stuff on the higher shelves has more potential energy than the stuff on the lower shelves. Don't believe me? Here, hold on, hold on. Look at this state-of-the-art traffic controller. Right now, it's sitting up here on this high shelf. Now, if it were to fall, it would be going fast, which means it would have a lot of kinetic energy. <laughs> you see, when it fell down, it had enough kinetic energy to completely break itself apart. Um, yeah. Well, that's the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. Look at this bagel, just sitting here, not moving, minding its own business on top of this ramp. It's all potential energy and no kinetic energy. And when it gets to the floor, it's all kinetic energy and no potential energy. <laughs> and now it has neither because it's on the floor and it's not moving. <laughs> Five second rule. And now you know your energy. So what do you say? You want this thing? Uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a discount because, because you know it's it's gently used. Hey, I'll even throw in this bagel, huh? Also gently used. Anthony and I are maxing out the spool racer. We start with a long coil of bungee cord, which is kind of like a giant elastic, and feed it through the spool. Then we put on a big piece of plastic to act as our washer and use a long pole as the pencil. We flip the spool on its side to wind it up. Then we flip it back and it's ready to go. All right, so we have it all wound up and we're ready to try it again, but with one change. Uh, Phil. Yeah. What's with the trike? I ride the trike. It's like I always say, what's the point of building something big if I can't ride it? There's no way you're gonna fit on this thing. No, no, I don't I don't put my feet on the pedals. I put my feet here on the back, right? And okay, then, yeah, I get it, I get it. You got it? Uh, hold, hold on, I gotta do my helmet up. Safety first. You ready? I'm on it. Okay, three, two, one, go. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Amazing. All the stored energy in the bungee cord is being released and the spool starts to turn. There's even enough energy that I can get pulled along behind it. It's not going that fast, no, though. And it's... it's pretty good, though. It still pulls me. Right? 
Yeah, pretty good. So, spool racer, actually able to get pulled by it. Yeah. You know what, I think we can go even bigger. Bigger? Yes. Well, what did you have in mind? I'm glad you asked. is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. <laughs> and I thought we would do the same thing with this. What do you think? I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. Okay, so all we gotta do is just build it just like we built that other one. Just bigger. Except way bigger. Let's do it. <sighs> when you set a domino on its end, you're giving it potential energy because it can fall. Ooh, and when you put two dominoes together, you can start a chain reaction, because that one will fall into that one. Ah, but it's a lot more fun with more dominoes. Setting up a run of dominoes is a lot of fun, but it takes a flat surface and a steady hand. And if you want to do it yourself, add gaps, so if one part falls, it doesn't take out the whole run. Last one. There, I had some dominoes left, but I did it. I made the Science Max logo. See, Science right? Max. Sort of. Let's see how it works. Ready? Yeah! <laughs> now it's time to max it out. Giant maxed out dominoes! Even though these dominoes are giant, they're still gonna work the same. They're standing up on their ends, which means they've got some potential energy. And when I give this one a push, that potential is gonna turn into kinetic energy and it's gonna knock the next one and the next one and the next one. I, I hope, we, I don't know what's gonna happen, but let's find out, you ready? Okay, three, two, one. The problem is, when you use dominoes this big, setting them up again is a real chore. <sighs> this is a mouse trap. But don't worry, no mice are gonna be harmed in the making of this episode. Mouse traps are a great example of stored energy. You see, in order to set a mouse trap, you have to push this bar back. And it's hard to do because the spring holds it. And then you set the mouse trap by putting this little lever underneath this very sensitive trigger. And once you have it set, all that energy is stored as potential energy, but it'll go off with just the slightest touch, releasing the energy. So what if I had a number of mouse traps and they're all set and all of that potential energy is stored up and I dropped a number of ping pong balls on them? Well, then I could set off a chain reaction where one mouse trap flies and hits another mouse trap, then hits a ping pong ball and then they all go. Now this is something you can try at home, but do not set the mouse traps yourself. It can really hurt if it snaps on your fingers, so you should probably ask an adult to help you, and then you can see how brave the adults in your house are. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Mouse trap, chain reaction! <laughs> and last one, there we go. And now, let's max this out. Let's do it with 90 mouse traps. And this is a crate of ping pong balls. So, Let's see what happens when we put them together. Maxed out ping pong ball mouse trap chain reaction. <sighs> awesome. Ready? I'm on it. Anthony and I have built a large spool racer. Oh, it's working. It's working. <laughs> oh. 
And it worked so well, the only option was to go bigger. What is this? this is an industrial cable spool, and this is the biggest size that they make. I think this could generate a huge amount of energy. Huge... Building our giant spool racer is the same process as the other builds. So the steps are exactly the same, but on a larger scale. And this time, we're going to use, obviously, the large spool, and we're going to use this 2x4 as our pencil windy thing. Coil some bungee cord, feed it through. Ready? Yep. OK. Here it comes. Ah, there we go. Got it? Haha, <laughs> yeah. Add a washer and a long 2x4 to act as our pencil. And now we stick the giant 2x4 inside the coil. Just about. Yeah, we got it. There okay, we cool. go. And we're ready to try it out. So it looks like we're ready to go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do you want to do it in here or you want to do it outside? Oh, definitely outside. Okay, let's go. Yeah, okay, cool. Yep. Oh, it's heavy. Right. <laughs> Batteries are great at storing energy. They store electricity. Batteries! But if you're like me and you have a whole bunch of batteries and you don't remember which are the good ones and which are the dead ones, there's a trick that you can use to find out. Get a frying pan or a brick or a concrete floor or something else that's very, very hard and an adult's permission. Here's the secret. Dead batteries will bounce and batteries that still have some life in them won't. Watch. Good battery. Dead battery. Now, it's a little hard to see, but listen. One hit. Two hits. Here's what's going on. See, batteries store electricity in the form of a gel, sort of like modeling clay. This is modeling clay, fresh from the fields, where the pit, the pits, the Mine, wherever modeling clay comes from. And this is modeling clay I've left out for about five days, so it's all dried up and hard. Now, when modeling clay is new, it's all wet and soft. And when you drop it, it doesn't bounce very well. I've left this piece of modeling clay out to dry for about five days. Now it's all dried up and old and it bounces. New, old. So, same thing with the battery. Good batteries won't bounce, and bad batteries will. Science! Here's a fun chain reaction you can do with popsicle sticks, or craft sticks, because these ones are a little bit wider than popsicle sticks. It is because these kind of sticks are slightly bendy, and when you bend them and put them together in a pattern in a certain way, you can keep them under tension, and then they want to snap back, and then they'll fly. So here's how you make the pattern. Ready? You take a popsicle stick or a craft stick, and you put it down on the table. I know, OK, it's a slow start. And we take another one and put it across. Now comes the secret. The secret is over and then under. You want to put it over one and then under another, like that, and then this one over, under. Put it over the one that looks like it's the top stick and under the stick that looks like it's the bottom stick. And then it starts to hold tension. It starts to hold the potential energy. Continue this pattern. Each stick goes over and under the two sticks at the end. Now here's the trick. Soon as this one lets go, then that one will let go, then that one, then that one, then that one, and that's how you get the chain reaction. They all start flying up. So you have to build it with never letting go of that last stick. You have gotta always remember to keep a hand on it or else you'll have to start again. So, okay, so you ready? You wanna see me let it go? Here we go. I know, that isn't so great because it's better if it's a longer chain. So fortunately, I have a longer chain. I've got a binder clip on this end keeping the craft sticks together. Ready? Three. Two, one. Wow! Release of kinetic energy from the potential energy of winding all the craft sticks together. Fun, and you can totally do it at home. Now, let's max it out. Behold, almost 800 craft sticks in a long, nicely designed triangle. Ready? Two. One.
drastic chain reaction. I'm gonna go get something to clean this all up with. All right. So Anthony and I have built a giant spool racer and have taken it outside to try it out. In order to wind it up, we flipped over the last version on its side. But this spool weighs 200 kilograms. Easy to roll, almost impossible to flip over. Come on, get it. I don't think it's gonna work. It's too heavy to move. Yeah. We should have thought of that before. Well, I'm sure we'll think of something. Uh... So Anthony and I thought about it. <laughs> and thought about it. <sighs> and thought about it. I got it! What? No. No. But you... And the answer finally dawned. What if we roll it this way? Because then that would wind it up, right? That's brilliant! By rolling it backwards, we wind up the bungee cord in one direction, which will make it want to unwind in the other direction. Anthony and I roll it across the parking lot to get it wound up tight. I don't think I'm gonna hold it anymore. Okay. Okay. Let go. Uh, okay, okay, it's wedged. It worked. All right, one more thing. We're gonna hook the trike up to this one as well. Okay. Okay. So right now, it's all wound up, and when it gets moving, the potential energy in the coil will turn into kinetic. Exactly. Kinetic energy. Now, just in case you're tempted to try this at home, I need to tell you, do not try this at home. We're trained professionals, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Well, as much as anybody can be trained for this, because no one uh. really does this. <laughs> Are you ready? Ready! Okay, here we go! Oh. <laughs> it's working! It's working! Yeah! <laughs> sure enough, all the potential energy we stored in the bungee cords starts to unwind, which rolls the spool and pulls me along behind it. What's more, that big heavy spool has a lot of momentum. Yeah. So when it gets going fast, it just wants to keep moving. It wasn't long before I had to jump off. Uh oh! oh. of kinetic energy. That was a ton of kinetic energy. There you go, science max, experiments at large, massive spool racer, your turn next? Yeah! Okay. <laughs> this episode of Science Max is all about building things strong. Two. And let's do three. An arched bridge, giant house of cards, magical stacking books, and more. Oh, I thought they were gonna do it. All on this episode of Science Max, experiments at large. Oh, hello, Science Maximites. We've got a lot of work today, so I was just getting prepared. You know, taking something flimsy and making it strong, that's what scientists and engineers do every day. And it's also pretty fun. You take something that's not that strong, and by the way you build it or put it together or change its shape, it suddenly becomes a lot stronger than you think it was. So I thought that's what we should do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We should build something. So we're gonna build an arched bridge and we're gonna build it out of sugar cubes. <laughs> so here's what you need. You need some sugar cubes, you need some sandpaper, and you need some modeling clay. So first, you want to make some abutments out of your modeling clay. What is an abutment, you ask? It is this. They distribute the force laterally from one side or the other. I like to use this. This is half a roll of duct tape. And so it fits in just like that. And you see, it's a perfect arch. If you just take sugar cubes and you try to stack them into an arch, it's not going to work because the sugar cubes may not even fit all together. And you can see only the bottoms are touching. I take up the guide and it all falls apart. So here's what you do. You take your sandpaper and you change the squares into trapezoids. And you start sanding down your sugar cubes into trapezoids. Basically, you want one small side and one long side. 
thin at the top, wide at the bottom, or wide at the top, thin at the bottom. It's a trapezoid no matter which way you hold it. Put it on the bridge and see. And as you go, you will see if you're doing it right, there will be no gaps. If you go to the Science Max website, there will be a guide that you can use to help you make the sugar cube bridge so you don't have to spend as long as I did making this one. And then the most important part is the keystone. That's the one that fits in right at the top, just like that. And when it does, you can take away the guide and it stays up. Isn't that cool? It stays up without any glue, without any mortar, all based on the shape of these sugar cubes. The cool thing is, it'll hold the weight of a whole car, provided you have a very, very small car. The reason why it works is because the weight is distributed along the arch into the abutments and down into the ground. That's what makes an arch bridge so strong. And that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna max out an arch bridge. So I think I'm gonna need some help though. Uh, maybe Sonia from the Ontario Science Center. She really knows her stuff. Um, yeah, I'll go there and I'll see if she's busy. All right, come on, let's go. Sonia. Hey, Phil, how's it going? It's going good. I was wondering if you could give me a hand with something. Okay, what's I'm, up? I'm building, um, well, it's actually, it's easier if I show you. All right. Do you mind coming back to Science Max headquarters? We can take the portal. But that thing doesn't always work. Oh, it is fine. Well, I mean, that worked just fine. Uh-oh, it usually makes a beeping when I do, oh. It's out of batteries. Oh, I told myself, Phil, charge the, charge the remote before you leave the lab, and then I... Where have you been? Uh, Free? Uh, Free? The remote ran out of battery, so I had to run the last three kilometers. Sorry. You I made it. Long story. So the sugar cube bridge. You had a chance to look at it, right? Uh -huh. This works on any scale, mm -hmm. right? It should, any no matter scale. what size arch, it should be the same, right? Definitely. Good, because what I want to do is use these abutments, but go to these abutments. Oh. So we're going to start the bridge here, and I've already created a thing that to we can use to put the, support? the sugar cubes on as we go up so that we can make sure that it becomes a perfect arch. Yeah. Do we have enough sugar for this? Yep. I got tons of sugar. Wow. Yeah. So I think we're going to need some glue because it's going to be really hard to get these to stay. Yep. To stay, stay right on. there without a little bit of glue. We're going to make a giant arch, maybe some walls, and, and we'll see what happens. Let's do it. Oops, uh, an egg. Now you might think of eggs as kind of flimsy and they do break pretty easily, but eggs, <laughs> eggs are actually stronger than you think. It's because they're, well, egg shaped. You see, the top of the egg is like a little bit of an arch and the bottom of the egg is also like an arch and arches distribute the weight just like they do in a bridge. Here's how you can experiment with how strong eggs are. First, you wanna get a pair of gloves to protect your hands from the shell just in case anything goes wrong. You should also tell an adult that you're doing this experiment because if it does go wrong, you're gonna have some mess to explain. And also, you should probably put on some safety glasses. Now here's what you do. Take your egg and carefully put it in your palm just like that. And put it against your other palm and you're gonna push in directly on either side of the egg. Start pushing harder and harder. You can even lace your fingers and press even harder. And if you do it right, the egg won't break. Pretty amazing, right? So just how much weight does an egg hold? Can one egg support my entire weight. Let's find out. I'm gonna lift my weight up like this and lower myself down. And no, cannot hold my weight. Can my weight be supported by two eggs? Oh, nope. Phil's weight, four eggs. 
Oh, I thought they were gonna do it. Nope. My weight on eight eggs. Mm -hmm. Huh? <laughs> My weight can be supported by just eight eggs. Science! <laughs> Ooh, careful. <laughs> Sonia and I are on a quest to make a maxed out sugar cube bridge. The reason why an arch works is because the weight or the load of whatever's on top of the bridge is carried outward along the curve of the arch to the abutments at each end, which carry the load and keep the ends of the bridge from spreading out. No matter what you build your bridge out of sugar or stone, the science stays the same. Sonia and I are building a much larger bridge out of sugar cubes. We're using glue to help the sugar cubes stay together, just like stone bridges use mortar. And when we're finished, it was pretty impressive. A massive sugar cube bridge. Yep. Right? High fives for that. The moment of truth comes when we take out the support Ooh. and... Yeah! Yes! Awesome! Okay. Giant nice. okay. sugar cube bridge. So do you think it'll hold some weight? I think it definitely should, because right now we have an arch, mm -hmm. perfect arch, and the weight is being distributed to the sides of the base, so. So that's what it's for, right? We can put weight on there? We can definitely put some weight. One to start? Let's start off with one. Okay. And let's see how it goes. All right. Here we go. All right. Yeah, one book, yeah. All right, Sugar Cube Bridge. One book. Two books. I'm nervous. Yeah! <laughs> sugar, books. Sugar Cube Bridge, three books. Three books. Oh, that was great. It, it held up three books. Three. Well, technically it held up two books and broke on the third. So it's kind of still far from how much weight we want to hold because we want to cross it. We definitely want to cross it, so that means we need something bigger and stronger. The cube yeah, works. You're right, because the cubes are great because that keeps the science the same. Yeah. Right? So something cubular. The milk crate, really? Definitely. I think we should use those. It's a cube. It is a cube. A whole bunch of milk crates, and we'll see what we can do. I think that sounds great. Awesome. Whoa. This is a Prince Rupert's drop. It's a piece of glass that has a long, snaky tail and a bulb at one end. So what's so interesting about a glass tadpole? Well, I'll show you, and remember, this is just glass. Oh, Prince Rupert's drops are very strong, almost as strong as steel. It's all in how they're made. Molten glass is dropped into cold water. What happens is the outer part of the drop cools off first, leaving the inner part still hot. When the inner part eventually cools, it contracts, pulling everything in tighter and tighter, keeping it under a lot of tension. And because it's round, the force you put on it is distributed all the way around, just like the force is distributed on an arched bridge. Until you get to the tail. Just the tiniest break in the tail, and... It explodes. All that energy is released in a chain reaction. Why it's so strong you can hammer on one end, but explodes when you break the other, puzzled scientists for centuries. But now we know it's all in how it's made. The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic, and you will be granted entry. Send in the next applicant. <laughs> okay, don't let them see you. Don't let them see you. Okay. Magic smoke, and here we go, big entrance! Behold it is I, Overwhelmo! You again. I only have to demonstrate magic one time, and you have to let me into the Wizard Academy. And last, last time does not count. So prepare for your mind to be boggled, and your eyes to also be boggled, because I shall do a trick. I will just get to it. Here is a book, behold! And now, 
feast your stupefaction as I produce another book! Ha ha! And then, two or three more times, behold, as I put, as I, that's good. Behold! And now, look upon the wonderment as I stack these books on top of each other, like this, and now, feast more stupefaction as I, I cleverly move the books off the table. And now, now comes the magic word. Now, I say the magic word. The magic word! And behold, the book is levitating. It is completely off the table. I have done it. Magic! No. No? Not magic, that's science. But the book is levitating. No. Look at it, it's not even touching the table. No, it's being supported by the books below because of the center of mass. Preposterous. I'm afraid it's very posterous. Each book is balanced on the one below in a way that the center of mass is behind the edge of the book below. And the entire stack's center of mass is behind the edge of the table. So it may look like magic, but it's science. So... I can't get into the Wizard Academy? No, I'm afraid not. I, uh, good... Alakazam! You will rule the day that Overwhelmo did not I will return, and then you will see. Oh, ow. Sony and I made a large bridge out of sugar cubes, and it didn't hold much weight. So now we're going to try making another arch bridge, but instead of sugar cubes, we're going to use milk crates. There we go. I've made some abutments out of giant crates. And this is where we're going to start our bridge. And they start there, and it goes in a big arch. But we're going to be using. I brought milk crates. Milk crates. High fives. Woo! High fives. Two. So we start our bridge. This is a straight line. It's not a. It's not an arch. It's not an arch. But it's clear we have a problem. Okay, ready? Oh! That didn't work, Phil. <laughs> we're like. It's like we're back to the beginning again. So this is like two straight lines. Yeah, two it's, straight lines. It's yep. Like a triangle. We need an arch. So we're going to need a support. Sony and I build a support to help us make a curve the milk crates can follow. But after we finish stacking, there is a problem. It doesn't look very solid. Yeah, it doesn't, does it? Here. Oh, yeah. Because everything is, there's a gap at the top of all of them. Look, that one, there's a gap. There's a That's gap there. there. There's a big there's a one gap here. There. It's well, not I mean, making our bridge very solid. There's only one way to find out for sure. You can try it. Is to pull this out and see if it stands up. Let's do it. Okay. So, didn't stay up. Didn't stay up. Okay. That's all right, though. I'm not sure why it isn't staying up. Like, the sugar cubes were cubes. Mm -hmm, that's a cube. Milk crates are cubes. But we did change the shape of the cube. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you remember, when I first built my sugar cube bridge, it didn't work with cubes. You have to sand the cubes down to make them into trapezoids. You can't build a perfect arch out of cubes. So they were tall, wider here and then narrower there so that they had... Oh, so that's the problem. Yep. So I could, like, cut it? I could cut it. I could cut it. You could. You could. I could cut it. That's going to take a long time, though. If we cut the milk crates into trapezoids, everything will work, right? Right? We take a milk crate and with the right safety gear, we cut it so we can reshape it into a trapezoid. Good. And it works, but... It's going to take a long time, isn't it? Definitely. So uh. how about this? I have an idea. So remember when we did the experiment and we had lots of V gaps? Yeah. How about we put some wooden wedges into those gaps to make it one secure structure? So they, it was sitting like this. Exactly. So what we're going to do is insert wooden pieces right here so we'll fill those gaps. I get it. And we'll make it one secure structure. Ah, okay. instead of cutting all of our milk crates, we can keep the milk crates. Yep. And they can be solid and we just add to it rather than take Taken away. Taken away, exactly. That is a smart idea. Okay, so let's make some wedges. All right. Oh, hey, how you doing? Let me guess, you want to build a strong structure, something that'll stand the test of time. Well, you know you got to use the right kind of shapes. Look at this, a square. Now, squares have got to be strong, right? Well, maybe. Maybe if you press straight down on it, but watch as I push to the side. 
Oh no! The thing that I have built is now collapsing because squares aren't in fact strong after all. If only I had listened to Sal's sage advice. Yeah, squares aren't gonna cut it. Fortunately, there's a shape that's strong in all kinds of ways. A triangle. Okay, so you heard of triangles before, good for you. But look at this. You can push down from the top and it doesn't move, or you can push from the side and it doesn't move. Triangles are awfully pointy. How do I build with them? Observe, ha <laughs> ha. Triangle here, triangle there, platform on top. And watch, no matter how I try to shift it, it stays solid. And check this out. Triangle here, second triangle there, and a third triangle shape here. That's like three triangles for the price of two, huh? That's a good deal. So there you have it. The triangle, one of the greatest shapes to build with. This is a house of cards, and if you've never built a house of cards, you should definitely try. Try, because it's not easy. What you need to do is you need to make triangles with the cards. If you do it just right, ha ha, they'll stay up. Then you take another pair of cards, like that, and you take another card and you put it on top Ah, and it stays up. Keep on building by making triangles and putting another card across the top like a roof. Then, when you're ready, you can start to make a second layer. It takes a lot of patience to make a house of cards. But with enough patience and really steady hands, you might be able to finish it. There we go. Ha ha, a house of cards. Now, let's max it out. Backing away slowly, backing away slowly. To build our maxed out card house, the Science Max build team and I used large pieces of foam insulation, which were super light and easy to work with. Once we set up the first layer, we needed to bring in a scissor lift so we could keep building the next layers. By the time we got to the top, our card house was 10 meters tall. Yeah, giant house of cards. And now that I've built a giant house of cards, what do I do with it? I knock it down. <laughs> Science! I'm gonna build it again. Sonia and I are rebuilding our milk crate bridge. Since cubes don't work if you're trying to make an arch and changing the shape of each milk crate would take too long, we're using wooden wedges to fill the gaps at the top of the milk crates. Once we get the wedges in, the milk crates have support at their tops and they make a perfect arch. Are you ready? I'm ready. All we have to do is pull the wooden thing out and if it holds up on its own, we've done it. We pull out the support and it stands. It works. The bridge supports itself. Now it's time for the final test. We try to walk on this bridge. So we spent some time making sure our bridge was safe. We added a crash mat and we built a second arch. We sure did. So that it's a little bit wider and it feels very solid. So the only thing to do now is to test it. Test it out. You gonna do it? I absolutely will. All right. Absolutely. Sonia puts on a helmet and gives it a try. And sure enough, it works. Yeah! Milk Crate Bridge! Milk Crate Bridge! Milk Crate Bridge! Woohoohoohoo! Science Max experiments at large! Milk Crate Bridge! Yeah! Yay for science! High five! High five! Uh, <sighs> Greetings, Science Maximites! <clears throat> Welcome to Science Max <clears throat> experiments at large. My name is Phil, and today we're gonna be looking at water. But. <clears throat> Water is very heavy, but that's okay because we need it to be heavy for this experiment to work. I don't know if I need that much of it though. Maybe I can get, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, that's probably all I need. Today, we're going to be building a water-powered car. You'll need a base for your car, like this styrofoam, water bottles, shish kebab skewers, straws, scissors, elastics, paper plates, tape, a square of paper towel, modeling clay, vinegar, baking soda, water, and glue or a hot glue gun if you have an adult to help you, and uh, yeah, I know, this one is pretty involved. 
That's why you should go to the website for step-by-step -step instructions. Take your paper plates and glue two together to make a wheel. Then make three more. Wrap elastics around your base and then tape straws on the bottom. Trim them down, maybe about that much. Then take your shish kebab skewers and push it through a water bottle cap to make a hole. Then stick one wheel on, put the skewer through the straw, and do the same thing on the other three sides. Then take the water bottle cap and get an adult to help you make a perfect hole in it so that it fits your straw. Then use some modeling clay and hot glue to seal the straw and the cap so it's airtight. Attach the water bottle to the base of your car, then fill it with some water and vinegar. Next, you'll want to wrap up a spoonful of baking soda in the square of paper towel so you can make a little package. Finally, stick something underneath the underside of the bottle to raise the end up off the base. Bring your cap and then go outside. Ah, here we are outside. Yeah, I know, we're not really outside, but I have a science lab and you probably don't, so I highly recommend you do this outside. And don't forget your safety glasses. Now, this is why we make a little packet of baking soda, because we want to delay this reaction as long as we can. So I like to hold it there. We'll hold it there with one finger so I can get the cap ready, because we don't want it to react until we can get the cap on and then kink the straw to keep the pressure inside till we're ready to let it go. Then at the last second, you want to drop that packet in and quickly cap it and kink the straw. And woohoo! <laughs> There you go, a water-powered car. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, wait a minute, that's a vinegar and baking soda-powered car? Well, kind of. The vinegar and baking soda create a gas, and that gas creates pressure in the bottle, and that pressure forces the water out of the bottle. But it's the water leaving the bottle that creates the thrust. The water going that way pushes the car that way. Newton's third law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So what we're going to do is max out the water-powered car. Figure out how to get water going that way so we can go that way. But we means me and someone else. Who can help me? Oh, I know, Anthony from the Ontario Science Centre. He'd be great at this. Hopefully he's not busy. We're going to max out the water-powered car. <laughs> Phil, oh, sorry about that. Did I scare you? Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, how you doing? Awesome, thanks. Great. I was wondering if I could get your help on an experiment. Yeah, okay. Which one? Uh, I'm building a water-powered car. It's going to be great. It's Science of Max Headquarters. I'll, I'll show you. Phil? Anthony? Phil? I'm here. What? Phil, where are we? Oh, this is the parking lot for Science Max Headquarters. Oh. So, okay. today, yeah. I want to max out the water car. This thing is awesome. Yeah, so what you do is you use vinegar and baking soda, yeah. and you pressurize this container, and, okay. and the water shoots out that way. So the car goes this way. Ah, Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah, you know okay. your stuff. This okay. is why you're here. This is because I could really use your help and advice on how to make this bigger. OK, so we're going to need a bigger tank to pressurize. Uh, so this, what about something like this? So we need something that can hold pressure. Do you think this would work? I don't know if we'd want to. And we'd have to put like pressure fittings on the barrel, like like cut a hole yeah. and weld them on. I don't know if that's. Something tells me this wouldn't work. So OK, need, sure. Um... I got some other stuff over there maybe that we could uh, use. Oh, ah, ah, check this out. Yeah, I think this would work. This would work a lot better. Well, this is my stand-up wash tub base. Your what? So yeah. we'll, we'll reuse it. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm thinking yeah. now, though? Uh, I yeah. know this. The problem is, I think this is like an oil drum, right? It and, is. And it's, a, it's an oil tank from a house. And these things are not built for pressure. You can get water tanks that you pressurize. Oh, uh, like hot water heaters. Yeah, you can uh, pressurize. They're built for that stuff. You pressurize them in your basement, and then the water travels up to, to like, the top your floor. shower that or makes... something like that. So we, all we need to do is get a pressurized water tank. OK. Put water in it, put pressure in it, and put it on wheels. <laughs> and then we open the valve and it goes, right? That sounds amazing. All yeah, right. let's get to it, man. OK. okay we, I got uh... some water tanks over here in this corner of the parking lot. Seriously? Being a chef is my absolute passion. 
and cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. When you're a professional chef like me, you spend lots of time perfecting the perfect recipes. I know my way around a kitchen, and today I'd like to show you one... That's not the fridge. Oh. <laughs> today I'd like to show you one of my favorites. Quail truffle gazpacho cakes on a plate of ice. Beautiful. And here's how to make it. Take some quail, some truffle, and some gazpacho and put it into a cake. Delicious. And here's the interesting part. How to make the plate of ice. Ooh. How did I do it? Well, I tried many different methods, and none were very successful. <laughs> but now I let science do the work for me. So here's what I do. You see, I've got my large block of ice, and I've got a fishing line over the top, and on the bottom, I've got two heavy weights. Now we wait. The heavy weights put pressure on the fishing line. This pressure melts the ice where it's pressing down. As the ice melts, the fishing line moves through the block of ice and eventually cuts its way through. There we are. My hours of waiting have almost paid off. You see, I've got a perfect line through the ice and I stopped it just before it finished. It's the pressure of the line on the ice that makes it work. The same thing happens when you use ice skates. You see, it's a very thin line and your body weight presses down on the ice, melts it a bit, and that allows you to glide across the ice. It also allows me to just pop this off. There you are, you see? Perfect plate of ice to put my delicacy on. Let's just try that now. There we go. Um... So I've joined Anthony and we're going to max out our water-powered car. Our small design works by creating gas, which creates pressure, which forces the water out of the bottle, creating thrust. Our new plan is to get a water tank, put it on wheels, and put water in it. Then we use an air compressor to pressurize the air inside. When we open the valve, the water is forced out this way, which causes our water car to go that way. Okay. Ha-ha! <laughs> so, water car, maxed out version. Aha, uh -huh, huge water yep. tank. And filled with lots of water and lots of, uh, lots of air. air. So, yeah, pretty good, right? Whoa. <laughs> it's a lot of it. So, did it mess up, did it mess up my hair? Uh, no, you look fine, you look great. Okay, good. Now, the only thing left is we just gotta open uh, this valve here, right? Yeah. You wanna do the others? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do it, okay. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, go! We open the valve and our pressurized tank moves forward. The air pressure in the tank forces the water out with enough force to move the tank. Awesome! That was awesome! That was a great run, yeah! That was amazing! So, pressurized water tank on wheels. Totally worked. Totally worked. Total success, yeah. Um, so, because this is Science Max, the only thing we can do now is make it bigger. Bigger, right? exactly, okay. yeah. So, uh, problem is, I don't think we're gonna find a tank bigger than this one. Yeah. Um, so, because then it would be too heavy, right? Exactly. Much way bigger. Too heavy. Maybe maybe what we can do is just get a lot more water. Okay. And then and then we find a way to pressurize the water. Oh, so don't pressurize the whole tank. Just just the stream of water that's going out As of the tank. As it comes out, exactly. Something kind of like a like a fire hose. A fire hose, right? So so we take a big container of water, right? And we I guess we would need a pump. Yeah, like a pump would be perfect. So then yeah. we we suck the water out of the container, put it through the pump to pressurize it, shoot it out of a wa uh, fire hose. Uh huh. And then our car. Goes flying. Goes flying. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. All, All right. right. Amazing. When water is going fast, it has a lot of force. This is a power washer. It's made for cleaning concrete and wooden decks, but it doesn't use soap and it doesn't use heat. It only uses the power of water. Let's try it out. The power washer creates a stream of water that is moving really fast. It has the force to clean concrete, strip the paint, or even the Science Max logo off wood. But how do I max out the power washer? What's the most ultimate use I can think of? 
Power washer, pumpkin carving. The power of the pressure washer creates a stream of water strong enough to make short work of my pumpkin. Power washers may only shoot water, but they can be dangerous, so don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah, science! The Wizard Academy. All you have to do is demonstrate true magic and you'll be granted entry. Send in the next candidate. Oh, no, not Overwhelmo. Did someone say Overwhelmo? No, wait, no, next. Oh, not that. Okay, okay, good, okay. Behold the design, Overwhelmo! Welcome back, Overwhelmo. If you can truly demonstrate magic, you may join the Wizard Academy. A glass of water! <laughs> no, no, wait, that is not a whole trick. Okay, hold on. Okay, and this, a waterproof playing card. I put the card on the glass and flip it upside down, and then I say the magic word. The magic word. And behold, magic! <laughs> Yes? Is that it? Yes? Well, it's not magic. It is defying gravity! Nope. The water would fall and the card would fall to the floor. It's not magic. This is magic! No, it's science. Horse feathers! Look, the reason the water doesn't come out is the air at the top of the glass keeps it held in by suction. More air would have to get into this glass to decrease the suction, and because the playing card is keeping a seal on the glass, the suction of the air is holding the weight of the water up. Boulder Nash! Uh, all right, look, let's do a little experiment then, shall we? Let's move the playing card just a little bit from the edge of the glass. You see those bubbles? Yes. That's bad news. <laughs> Science, not magic. Well, I will return, and then you will see your mind will be melted by by the. No, that's not my, my music. Hold, hold. Will you will rule the day when? That's not my new order. Overwhelmo shall return. Our maxed out water car worked pretty well. Now it's time for something even more maxed out. We start with a giant tank on wheels. We add a pump to pressurize the water and a fire hose to shoot it out the back. What's more, this version is big enough for me and Anthony to ride. Water car! It's amazing! This is the more super improved water car. This so. tank holds 1,000 liters. And right now it has 720 liters of water. We have a pump. A pump, that's water right, pump. our water pump. So the idea is we take the water from this container out through your hose, really pressurized, going really fast that way. Our car goes really fast this way. All we gotta do is just turn on the pump and we're ready to go. So we fire up the pump and the water stream comes out really strong. So strong I can barely hold on to it. But even so, there's a problem. Yeah. Nothing happened. No, nothing really. Well, something happened. We got wet, but it didn't really. Okay. It's too heavy. Too heavy. So you're on it and I'm on it. That's a lot of weight. So we don't this. ride it. That's something. Yeah. And uh, also. This is kind of going crazy. Yeah. Because if nobody's holding it, it's just going to flap around. So we'll have a brace here. Yeah. Shoots it that way. That's good. And then we'll need, I feel like we'll 
needs something to kind of propel it. Maybe a better propulsion system. Kind of like uh, one of those steamboats. So we put a big paddle wheel here. Exactly. And we aim it, I guess we aim it like down. down at the, yeah, exactly. Like that, and then at the paddle wheel, and then the paddle wheel spins, and that propels the car. Exactly. Right? Right. OK. OK, well, we can do that. Let's do it. Sounds good, Let's yeah. Together. You know what? I have a paddle wheel because I had a failed hydroelectric. on the watercraft behind me creates the water pressure, which travels up the hose and through the jets. The force of the water is strong enough that I can use it to fly around. So what's the difference between this and a water car? Well, we don't have to take that much water with us because it starts in the lake and ends up in the lake. So the only water I have to carry is in the hose that goes up to the platform. <laughs> Flyboarding is lots of fun, but it takes some practice to get it right. Bouncing on jets of water isn't easy, but I got the hang of it. It's all due to Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Oh. Oh. Physics! Woohoo! Our maxed out water car didn't work so well. The main reason is that that much water is heavy. 720 kilograms. Yeah. So Anthony and I have a plan. Rather than rely on the force of the water going straight out the hose, we're gonna put a water wheel on the back of the water car. A water wheel works by catching water in the segments of the wheel. The weight of the water on one side of the wheel causes it to start turning. But we're gonna use the weight of the water and the pressure of the water. Hopefully both combined will be enough force to turn the wheel, which will drive our water car forward. A little construction, and we have it ready to go. OK, so here's the latest version of the water car, Water Wheel. Yeah. All right. Yeah, there we go. We try it out, but there's a problem. The trick with the water car is the water itself weighs a lot. Every liter is one kilogram. So our 720 liters we start with is way too heavy to get the car moving in the beginning. But as the water gets pumped out, there's a sweet spot where the weight is low enough the water car might move. But then there's only a little water left, so it's a balancing act. We fill it again and see if we can come up with a plan. OK, new and improved version, only half full. So the idea this time is because we're starting with it only half full, right? Uh -huh. yeah. Then it'll begin to go a little easier because it won't have as much weight as it had the last time we did it. And Phil, yeah? I can't even move this thing. What? I don't, I don't think, I think there's too much fuel. There's too much. Yeah, there's no way we can move this. There's no way this is gonna be able to move. Even awesome. half full. You even can't half full. Move it. I think we need less fuel than we're gonna get down to like maybe like a quarter or something like that. The thing is we ran it from the full tank last time and it and it never Okay. It so never moved at all. What if what if we gave it like a, a push to kind of help it get over that little like that little bump of energy? Ah, oh, so give it a, the 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 first push when it's a still got a bunch of water in it, we give it a bit of a push, and then maybe it'll go in its exactly, own. Exactly, exactly. OK, Wanna yeah, absolutely, let's okay. do it. We start the pump and wait for the amount of water to get to just the right spot. Then we give it a push while it's still kind of heavy to start it moving. Sure enough, that push makes all the difference. Yeah, it's working! The water car is light enough to roll, has some momentum to keep it going, and the force of the water coming out the pump is enough to keep it moving forward on its own. Still going! Oh. All right! Oh, amazing! Yeah! Look at it, man! This thing worked like a beauty! It worked all, it went all the way that way. Yeah! Way to go! The water car, finally, a success. It was the push. It was the push. That's all we needed to get it going. A bit yeah. of a push to get it going and a lot less water, and uh -huh. there you go. It totally works. All right, you want to do it again? Absolutely! All right, here we go. Okay. See you next time on Science Max Experiments at Large. So much so easier to push it without any water inside it.
Gravity. 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 Gravity makes things fall. But on this episode, I'm doing everything I can to defy gravity. Oh, you win this one, Gravity. From a hoop glider, to an egg drop, to a hover balloon, it's a gravity-defying dance party. All on this episode of Science Max Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max Experiments at Large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max, we're going to be looking at gravity. What goes up must come down. Today... <laughs> gravity is the force that makes things fall. <laughs> Towards the ground. But just because it's a force of nature doesn't mean that we have to listen to it. No! Today on Science Max, experiments at large, we're going to use everything in the power of science to defy gravity! Ha-ha! <laughs> we are going to be making a hoop glider. Now, hoop gliders may not look like much, but they fly just like paper airplanes. Woohoo! And here's how you can make a hoop glider. Here's how you can make a hoop glider all your own. This is what you need. Index cards, scissors, straw, ruler, pencil, and of course, science tape, which is just like regular tape, except you use this kind of tape for science. So, here's how you do it. Take your index card and cut it into three equal lengths. Take two strips, and you take your science tape, and you tape those two strips and make a hoop out of it. And with the small strip, you want to make another hoop. Now, what you want to do is take your straw. Now, this straw has a little scoop at the end, and that's not very aerodynamic, so we're going to get rid of that. Ooh, maybe it was kind of aerodynamic. All right, now that we've got the straw, you have to align the hoop and the straw together. So here's what I like to do. Take some science tape and stick it on the straw, and then align it so that it's perfectly straight, and then stick it on. Looks straight to me, all right? The small hoop also has to be perfectly aligned with the first hoop. So again, put the tape on the strap first, then align them up, and then start looking down through it to make sure it's aligned. There. Once you have it all taped together, you're done your hoop glider. And it flies just like a paper airplane. Boom! Awesome. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to... We're gonna, oh yeah, I gotta clean that up. We are going to max out the hoop glider. I'm gonna go meet Sonia at the Ontario Science Center and mm -hmm. we are going to max out the hoop glider into a giant version. We'll probably have to change the materials we use because oh, I don't think we can get a straw that big or a cardboard, but still, we can figure it out. All right, here I go. Aha! Oh, hi, Phil! Yeah, what? Pardon? You want me to help you with an experiment? Sonia, I came in. Phil, you came in you, here? I came are you in. okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Come on, let me show you. Okay. This is what I would like to max out. It was in my pocket when I fell, so what is it, that? It, it's a hoop glider. It was a hoop glider. So how do we max this out? First, we're gonna need a larger tube. To large replace tube. the straw, yeah. Exactly, and we're gonna need two hoops. So we need something that's flexible that will convert into a hoop. Okay, that's great. So uh, why don't we get started? Sounds good. All right, high fives. Okay. You may recognize this. It is a spring. Yes, good for you. But did you know that springs can defy gravity? Whoa. Gravity def defy. Gravity defy. Gravity defy. Look at it fly! Defying. Okay, not exactly, but 
What if I was to hold the spring like this and let it go? What'll happen? It'll fall. Yes, it'll fall. That's, that is true. But while it's falling, what happens to this end? Does it stay in one place? Does it go up or does it go down? Let's find out. I'll bring this in so you can really see it. Okay, ready? Watch close. Did you see? Did you, no? Okay, tell you what. We'll watch it again, this time in slow motion. See? The bottom doesn't move, and here's why. When the top of the spring is released, gravity and the tension of the spring are pulling on it. The bottom of the spring is being pulled down by gravity and up by the tension of the spring. These forces cancel out, stopping the bottom of the spring from falling until the top reaches it. Until there's no more tension, and then the top passes the bottom and the whole thing That is how it works. But here is the real question. Will it happen differently with a longer spring? Huh? Well, I just happen to have a longer spring! Let's max it out! Don't tangle it. So, now that I'm up high on this fire escape, let's test it out. Okay, three, two, one, go! A longer spring still has the same forces working on it. The tension of the spring pulling it up and gravity pulling it down. No matter what size of spring, these forces cancel out for the bottom of the spring until the top meets up with it. So there you go, an almost gravity-defying spring! <laughs> uh, hey, there's no door handle on this door. I guess I have to take the stairs. Whoa. Sonny and I are maxing out the hoop glider out of bigger and better materials. This is the largest tube I have, right? A giant ABS pipe and some bendable metal to make into hoops. Then we attach them all together and... Okay, big hoop is done. And little hoop is also done. Awesome. Not bad. Not bad at all. Super solid. And that's the thing. We have pretty heavy materials, so it might not fly as well as we'd like. But something heavy can always be good, right? Oh, no. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> See how solid it is? It's pretty solid. No damage whatsoever. You want to test it? I think we should. OK. I'm excited. We take our plastic and metal hoop glider outside to test it and... Ready? Ready. One, two, two three! Huh. huh. It didn't really fly, did it? Sonia and I made a very solid design, but the problem with it became pretty obvious. Yeah. It's just too heavy. Well, that's what science is. Back to the drawing board. Mini Here's something fun you can do if you ever get your hands on a helium balloon. Now, helium balloons float up, not because they defy gravity, but because they're lighter than air. It's because the heavier air around it actually falls past the balloon, and that ends up pushing the balloon up. But what if this helium balloon wasn't lighter than air or heavier than air? It was exactly the same. This is what I like to do. Just take a helium balloon with a long ribbon and a bunch of paper clips and adding a little bit of weight every time. And what we want to do is make this balloon neutrally buoyant. That means it won't go up or down but it will be neutral. You want to check it every once in a while. Let's see, three paper clips is clearly not enough. Five paper clips is, ooh, five paper clips is pretty close. It still might float down. So you want to take off just a little bit of weight, maybe about there. Watch this. You just take the balloon and you put it somewhere and it stays. It stays put. It doesn't go up. It doesn't go down. It's attached to nothing. Now, let's max it out. Huh. I had a big balloon, and it was a, uh, we had a, oh, there. <laughs> a giant balloon 
And look, it's a great paper towel delivery device. Say, did you want some paper towel? Here you go. Science. Yeah, don't worry about Ramona. Just put him up high. Put him up, yeah, higher. Good. Hey. Gravity. Gravity. Gravity makes things fall. Well, where do they fall? They fall down. Oh. Towards the center of the Earth. Gravity. It fell, didn't it? So, the Earth causes gravity, right? Well, yes. Gravity! Oh, come on. Come on. Everything that has mass has gravity. Gravity! But the Earth has so much mass that the gravity produced by everything else is like nothing. I mean, forget about it. But let's say I was in space with, uh, with this chicken. I would have gravity, and I could exert a gravitational force on this chicken. And if I get my angles right, I might be able to get the chicken to orbit me. Like, like a moon. Behold, my chicken moon. Huh? Gravity. But let's get serious. What causes gravity? We don't know. Ah! But what we do know is that without gravity, there would be no universe as we know it. No you, no me, no chicken moon. I'd miss my chicken moon. Chicken moon, you what? Gravity. Like it or not, the universe wouldn't exist without it. You like the sign? I'll give you a good deal. Uh, half off. Back to our hoop glider, which was too heavy. Here's what I don't get. This is heavy, but I can still pick it up and throw it. Yeah. An airplane is way heavier. I could never pick up an airplane, but that can fly. And that's because airplanes have engines, so it has a constant source of thrust. When we throw it, we just have an initial source of thrust, so we're throwing it. Eventually, loses its energy, therefore, it falls to the ground. I see. So we need something that's light. Light. And something that's strong. And strong. OK, well, let's see what we can find. All right. Sonia and I try a plastic tube and some heavy-duty paper. We make hoops and attach them with some duct tape and run outside to try it out. Hoop glider dance! Okay, three, two, one! I throw the hoop glider and although it doesn't keep flying forever, it goes much further than our first version and also further than I could have just thrown the pipe by itself. Pretty good! So we've done a good job of making something that flies. Why don't we make a couple different kinds out of different materials and we'll see if we can get one that flies even better than this. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Sonia and I have created a pretty good maxed out hoop glider, but we wanted to see if different materials would make an even better one. Sonia made a much lighter version. This time I used cardboard. And I, I made this, made a slightly heavier one. Let's do it. Okay, three, yep. two, one, go! Not bad. My turn. Here we go. Okay. <sighs> <laughs> that didn't really go very far at all, did it? No. Okay, so now we can measure it against the one that we threw before. And see that went pretty far. This went pretty far to see yeah. if we've got a better design here. Here we go. Right? Wow. Awesome! So, heavy one, no. Light one, no. Interesting. Uh, no. This design seems to be the best one. I keep thinking about how you were talking about thrust. Yep. All the thrust that we can put in is just what we can put in with one throw. Yeah. What if we could give it more thrust than that? How can we do that? Um, I don't know, like some sort of uh, slingshot or something. Like, a, it'd have to be a pretty big slingshot. A pretty though. big slingshot. Do you but think I can think make that it? sounds great, though. I think we make a big slingshot for this? Why not? OK, high five. Let's All do right. it. This is an egg. Eggs do not like to be dropped. 
Oh, fortunately, we can use the power of science to design something that'll keep the egg safe as it falls. Behold, my egg drop contraptions. The thing I really like about this experiment is there's no wrong way to do this. You can come up with any design you want and see if it works. This one here is a bunch of helium balloons. This structure is just to keep the helium balloons on so the egg can touch down very gently. Here it goes. Whoa. <laughs> and, and the egg is unharmed, miraculously sound. That one worked really well. Success. This is a giant helium balloon that I think will work pretty much the same way because I think this balloon will drop just slowly enough that the egg can actually just touch and nothing will happen. Um, so that didn't work. <laughs> and then there's this one, which has no slowing at all. It's all designed to just absorb the impact. And the idea is that the cone will crumple and absorb the force when it hits the bottom. Oh, no! Oh, no. I think it would have worked if it hadn't turned in the air, but it did, and... Well, I guess the egg is completely broken. So I'd call that one a fail. This one is the parachute. You see the egg has been nestled into this foam container. And this is a parachute that will hopefully slow the egg down. Woo! Uh-oh. Whoa. Over, over, good. And ah, <laughs> that one seemed to work well. Yep, the egg is totally fine. <laughs> the parachute worked. All right, egg drop experiment, totally fun experiment to do. But the question is, how do we max it out? And the answer is pumpkin drop. <laughs> Same thing, except with a pumpkin instead of an egg. Come on. OK. <laughs> all right, pumpkin drop with everything attached all at once. OK, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. So what we've learned from this is the heavier something is, the more force is acting on it from gravity, which means the harder it is to slow down when it's falling. OK, fair enough. You win this one, gravity. But I'll beat you next time. I'm. I'm going to get a broom. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. <laughs> Delicious. Nothing is more important to have fresh than your seafood. It's what makes the difference between a fresh fish Ah, and one that isn't so fresh. <laughs> if you live by the ocean, you probably know that the water gets high tide and low tide. Look closely, it's the same location. Amazing. Oh. But did you know that this is caused by the gravity of the moon and the sun? See, this cookie is the Earth. And this little happy fellow is me. Hello. And this string represents the water around the Earth. If we didn't have gravity to worry about, the water would all be equally deep around the Earth. But here comes the moon, this mushroom. Now, the moon has gravity, and that pulls the oceans towards it a little bit, like this. And that creates high tide there, and low tide here, and a little bump of high tide on the other side of the Earth. And as the Earth rotates and I'm on it, I experience low tide and high tide and low tide and high tide. Very interesting. But there's another factor. The sun, or this lemon. Now, the sun also affects the tides, but not as much as the moon. Now, the sun does not affect the tides as much as the moon because it's much further away, but it still has an effect. If the sun was here, then the tides would be pulled away a little bit like that, and the tides would be less severe. But if the moon and the sun line up, like over here, you'd get a very, very high tide and very, very low tide. So there you are. That's how the tides are affected by the gravity of the moon and the sun. Mmm, delicious. 
I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Our maxed out hoop ladder was working pretty well. That was pretty amazing. Good. Here we go. But we could only give it so much thrust by throwing it. Yeah. So we came up with the perfect science max solution. Our giant slingshot. <laughs> We pull the bungee cord back and hook it onto our hoop glider. I am ready to fire. Count me down. Three, two, launch it! <laughs> Very nice! Our slingshot is amazing. By giving the glider more thrust, that is, more energy at the beginning so it's going faster when we launch it, the glider soars through the air and flies a long way. That was great! So there you go, giant hoop glider! Yeah! Science Max, experiments at large, nicely done. Nice. What more could you ask for? Well, it's my turn. Hey, see you next time. This episode of Science Max is all about hot and cold. A giant hot air balloon, dry ice, the coldest temperature possible. Absolute zero and whatever this is. Blubber suit! All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and welcome to Science Max, Experiments at Large. We're gonna be making one of the easiest and one of the hardest experiments to do. Here's what we're gonna make, a hot air balloon. And it's pretty easy to make. That's why it's one of the easiest experiments. All you need is a plastic bag, but not any plastic bag. The kind of plastic bags you get at the grocery store to put your fruit in. That kind of plastic is very thin, very light, good for hot air balloons. And you just wanna put two paper clips on the bottom of the bag to hold the bottom down. Now here's the other thing you need. You need an adult and a hairdryer. Turn the hairdryer on. Put the heat on the highest setting and the fan on the lowest setting. The air inside the bag is getting hotter, which means the molecules are moving faster and they're getting further apart, which means there's going to be less of them in the same space. Less molecules means less weight and that means it's going to be lighter. The bigger the difference in temperature between the air inside the bag and the air outside the bag, the better it's going to work. So I recommend doing this outside, actually, on a cold day. When it's been long enough, turn the hairdryer off and it will float. Ha <laughs> ha, now it won't float very long because the air inside the bag will quickly return to its original temperature and it will no longer be any lighter than the air outside the bag. But it's definitely fun to fly for a while, while it lasts. So that's what we're gonna do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're gonna max out the hot air balloon and make a giant hot air balloon. Yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking, Phil, they already exist. Why don't you just get a giant hot air balloon? I mean, they're big and you, no, 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 no. There's no fun in that. I wanna make one I built myself. I don't think I'm gonna be able to fly in it, but it'll still be pretty cool, I bet. I just need someone to help me. Um, Oh, I know, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. Hopefully she's not busy. Oh, hey, Phil, how's it going? Hey, hey. Michaela, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, I was wondering if I could get your help with an experiment. Do you have some time? Yeah, I'd love to help out. Awesome, sure. okay, let's go back to Science Max headquarters and I'll show you what we're gonna do. Okay, nice. so ready, here we go. Nope, oh. still here, still here. Why are we still here? Uh, That's weird, okay, well, I know, I know, I know. No? Oh. Why is the code not working? I think it's the science center code. Try the, try oh, the app. Oh, it's the lab code, <laughs> right. Phil, are you okay? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine. So, Michaela, I'm glad you're here because today I wanna max this out. This is my hot air balloon. It was better before, I, I smushed it in my pocket, but what I did is I, I used a hairdryer, yeah. and then I put it in and I heated the air and, and then it, it rises up. Oh. So in order to max it out, pretty simple, I just get larger bags, right? And then I thought we could cut them and tape them together to make a much larger balloon. It's 
Good idea, but you know, if we're making a hot air balloon, we need to make sure our materials are really light. Uh, the duct tape seems a little heavy. Even this bag seems a little heavy to me. In terms of, oh, you In mean the weight. kind of plastic it is? Yeah, might be a little bit. it seems really thick, this one. Well, uh, do you know for sure? I've never tried it before. All right, well, that's science. We should try it and see what happens. Let's try it. Okay, so I'll cut along the side of the bag. You see that? Carbon dioxide gas. Our bodies breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Did you see it? Oh, take another look. How about now? No, you didn't see it, right? Because carbon dioxide is invisible unless you freeze it. This is dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. And this is wet ice. It's not really called wet ice. It's frozen water. Now, you know what temperature water freezes at? Starts with a zero, ends with a, well, it's actually zero, zero degrees Celsius. And this freezes at negative 79 degrees Celsius. It's much colder. I have to hold onto it with a glove because if I held onto it with my bare hands, I'd get frostbite. So here's the experiment. If I pour some liquid water on the dry ice, will it freeze again? Let's find out. Because the dry ice is so much colder than the freezing point of the water, the water begins to freeze from the bottom up in room temperature air right before our eyes. Whoa, totally frozen. Cool. Cool. In order to build our hot air balloon, Michaela and I are taking clear garbage bags, cutting them along the seams so they end up as one thin sheet of plastic, and taping them all together with duct tape into a balloon. Okay, so that's, nice. how many bags is that? It's like 12 bags. 12, so you think that's big enough? <laughs> I think so, it's pretty big. Okay, I think we can stop there. Okay, so where's the, where's the opening again? Uh, oh, I think I it's on your side. Hope you didn't duct tape it close. Okay, no, we're good, we're good. So. So it's gonna inflate like this. Wait a minute, let's, let's, okay, let's make sure it works. <laughs> Is it working? Uh, kind of. I don't know if it's <laughs> inflating. <laughs> okay, good. So it does inflate. It does hold air. Yeah. Right? So should we try it? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, so we're gonna use a hair dryer. <laughs> right? And now we wait. It's working. Kind right? of. Oh, yeah. Woohoo. Okay, it's almost inflated. All right. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, let's try it. Okay, on the count of three, we'll throw it, okay? Okay. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't quite float, it's huh? It's still too heavy, Phil. I think, think we got a couple problems here. The duct tape is really heavy. Yep. Also, these bags themselves are really heavy. Okay, well, if we want to fix the duct tape uh, problem, uh, we could use lighter tape. Like, what if, haha, yeah. -ha, we use um, invisible tape, or as I like to call it, science tape. Science tape. Which would be lighter than duct tape. That's a good plan. But what do we do about the bags? Have you ever seen those, you know, those dry cleaning bags? Oh, that wait, I've got work. one. I've got one here. Cool. Perfect. Aha! Yeah, perfect. Because, you know, when I get my lab coats dry clean. So let me see here. Oh, yeah, this is much lighter. This is kind of the same material as the, as the grocery store fruit bags, right? I have a better feeling about this one. So lighter tape, lighter bag means a much lighter balloon. OK, well, let's try it. First, I should probably take my lab coat out. is water. Now, it's ice water. <laughs> science. OK, no, that's not the science part. Here's something you can do at home. Get some ice water and a way to time yourself and stick your hand in the ice water. It's a little hard to stick your hand in ice water for a long period of time, because after a while, 
it starts to hurt. But don't worry, the pain that you're feeling isn't actually because you're damaging anything. It's just your body's way to tell you that you need to take your hand out of the cold water. Yeah, you usually can't do it for very long. But some animals, like seals and whales, they live in ice water all the time. They live in the Arctic, so how do they do it? One word, blubber. Blubber is a layer of fat that protects you from the cold, or protects a seal and a whale. We don't have blubber, but we are today gonna have some blubber, because we're gonna make a blubber glove. Blubber glove, I love saying that. Here's how we do it. First, we want blubber. Okay, this isn't blubber, this is lard, which is actually animal fat. You can use lard, you can use margarine, or butter, or shortening, anything with a lot of fat in it. And remember, this is messy, so definitely get an adult to help you. So we've got our lard, and we need a bag. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a scoop full of lard, like this, and you're gonna put it in the bag, like so. Mm-hmm that, there we go. And then, you're gonna start smoothing out the blubber or the lard like this. Because what you wanna do is have a nice, thin layer all the way around. See, starting to work, yeah. Then seal the bag and tape the edges, huh? A square of blubber. Then, do it again. Here, I have two bags of blubber, and I've taped all the way around the outside. So I have ha -ha, a blubber glove. Check it out. So let's try it out. I stick the blubber glove in the ice water. It's completely working. It is not even cold. The blubber is completely protecting my hand from the ice water. I'm not even remotely cold at all. That is very fun. So, try it yourself. A blubber glove. Now, how do we max out a blubber glove? <laughs> Watch. <laughs> water, ice water. I know for a fact that I wouldn't last more than 10 seconds in here without my blubber suit. I'm gonna make an entire outfit of blubber. I've got them in large plastic bags and I'm going to get completely suited up in blubber with the help of Trevor and Stephanie. Okay, guys, suit me up. That is very heavy. <laughs> Let's just go like this. Oh, okay. Time to cut back on the cookies. All right, let's do it. All right. Lover suit, go! <laughs> I can't. Okay. Okay, here we go. And... Okay, so far. Oh. <laughs> the legs are warm. And... Oh. Blubber suit! Ha ha ha! I am a seal! Actually, here I am in the, in the ice, and I don't feel too bad. Blubber suit works! Ah! Blubber suit's refreshing, actually. You just sit back and chill out. Well, there you go. Blubber suit success. Seals and whales are able to stay in ice water for their whole lives because they have protective layers of blubber, just like I do. Okay, so now, all I have to do is get out. <laughs> blubber suit! Oh no! My blubber is leaking! Ah, I've sprung a leak! My blubber! Oh, my precious blubber! No! What a world! <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Ugh, shut the door, it's cold out there. Ugh, cold enough for you, huh? Well, that's nothing. Let me tell you, you know what temperature water freezes at? Yeah, zero degrees Celsius, but even that is nothing. Let's say it's winter in Winnipeg. It could get down to minus 20, maybe even minus 40, but even that's nothing. Liquid nitrogen, minus 196 degrees Celsius, but even that's nothing. The vacuum of space! 
minus 271 degrees Celsius. But even that's nothing. So, what's the coldest temperature? What? What's the coldest temperature you can have? It's called absolute zero, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, all the little wiggling that particles do comes to a stop. Everything is frozen. No more movement, no more energy. Everything stops. It doesn't get any colder than that. Absolute zero is the ultimate nothing. Brr. Time to get your mittens on. Our first hot air balloon didn't float very well. It's huh? still too heavy, though. I think, think? we got a couple problems here. So we're making a lighter version out of dry cleaning bags and science tape, both lighter materials than our last version. We also went for more of a square shape than our last version, which kind of looked like a sock. Once we were done assembling, we got the hair dryer and tried it again. Ooh, it's sort of working. Kind of. It's inflating. That's something. Yeah. It's a start. <laughs> it, feels, it feels warm, like the hairdryer is actually making a lot of warm air in there. Yeah. This is definitely working better than the last version, because it's so much lighter. Yeah. Wait a minute. Almost got it. Oh. Yeah, it's sort of working, right? Cool. Kind of. <laughs> OK. Ready? Are we testing it? Turning off the hair dryer. Oh. Huh. It kind of collapses the moment we turn off the hair dryer. Not huh? what we expected, was it? Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, it sort of works. Oh. The thing is, our balloon is so big that we need to heat up all of the air that's in there. I don't know if this hair dryer is strong enough. I think you might be right. Um, mm. So we just need something else that pushes heat. Yeah, more um, heat. So more like power. a like a heater of some sort. Uh, you know, we've got some heaters up in this room, actually, and maybe I could just tear one out. We can use that. I like it. OK. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. There. Got it. An industrial heater. And this is going to work just the same as our hair dryer. It's going to blow a lot of hot air up here, but this is way more effective than a hair dryer, right? Yeah, way more powerful. So uh, we put the balloon over here. Hot air comes up. The balloon inflates and hopefully flies. Hopefully. All right, let's get the balloon. So we put the balloon on the heater and turned it on. But it doesn't seem like much is happening. That's because the heater pushes less air, but the air is much hotter, which means it took longer. Should we have brought a book? But soon it was inflating. Definitely a better result than the hair dryer. <laughs> okay, you ready? I think it's gonna work. It's gonna be awesome. All right. Yep. One, two, three, let go. Lift off. Yeah! It's like a giant jellyfish! That's huge! Uh oh, uh oh, it's tilting, it's tilting! No! No! Back down. <laughs> okay, so the so the balloon flies, which is great. Awesome. Um, the problem is it turns over in the air. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed that. And if it turns upside down, then all the hot air comes out, and and it doesn't fly anymore. Oh. I was thinking next time if we if we make it bigger, what if we had a little weight at the bottom just to keep it stable? Oh yeah, okay. I've I've seen balloons that have sort of an X, like a very light wood that goes across the opening at the bottom. Oh. Maybe we could tie a piece of rope to that to keep it weighted. And if the bottom is heavier, then it won't flip over upside down, right? Love that idea. Uh, so we're going to weight it at the bottom with yeah. a little X so that it doesn't flip over. And we're going to make a bigger balloon. <laughs> we're going to need more bags. Oh, right. Back to the bag store. Bag store. OK. <laughs> Wait for me. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Strange. The spoon is no sharper than it was before. <laughs> oh, hello. Welcome to Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker, and today we're cooking with coal. <laughs> today we're going to learn how to make a drink cool. Look at this bottle of lemonade. It's warm right now and not very refreshing. So, what's the best way to cool this down? We put it in ice, right? <laughs> But did you know there's an even better recipe than ice? You can make ice colder. It's true. All you need to do is add salt. I've got a second bowl of ice and a second jug of lemonade, and I've got two digital thermometers. What I'm going to do is add salt to this bowl. 
What the salt does is starts to melt the ice, and that actually consumes heat. This is called an endothermic reaction, and it absorbs heat, which makes the ice colder. And as you can see, this bowl of ice still sitting at around zero degrees Celsius, but this bowl, minus eight and falling. Wow. So there you have it, making something even colder than ice would normally make it. That is a way to make a refreshing glass of lemonade. I'm Buster Beaker, and thank you for joining me on Cooking with Science. Oh. With our new heater and lighter materials, our hot air balloon was floating free. That is, until it tipped over. When that happens, all the hot air inside escapes. But Michaela and I have a solution. So we decided to build an even bigger hot air balloon and add a way to keep it upright. So the process aside from that is pretty much the same. We put the end over top of our industrial heater and I will plug it in. Hi, hair dryer again for good measure. <laughs> it's working, it's inflating, but we gotta keep we gotta keep fluffing it up, otherwise it just sort of sags. But you can see the top of the balloon is is definitely working. It's a lot, it's a lot bigger than the last one though. Do you think we made it too big, Michaela? <laughs> it's really big. I think it's working. It's definitely working. Uh-oh, pull your side. Oh, oh it's totally working! <laughs> I'm so surprised that this works so well. So the stick is gonna keep it balance so the bottom faces down, but Michaela's gonna tie a string to the stick so that when it goes up, we can keep it centered. Okay, this looks good. You wanna let it go? Yeah, are we ready? Okay. Okay, three, two, one. Whoa! <laughs> yeah! So let's recap. The hotter air inside the balloon is less dense than the colder air on the outside. And because we were able to get the air hot enough and the balloon light enough, it floats. Science Max, experiments at large. Hot air balloon. Thank you, Michaela. Awesome. That was so cool. Wait a minute, who has the string? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs>